Well, good morning, Temecula Hills Christian Fellowship. If you want to grab our seats, we'll start our time this morning. These are the words of Mary, who after she found out that Jesus was be, being born, she quoted the Old Testament, and for a young Hebrew woman at the age of maybe 14 or 15 to know this is pretty, uh, pretty amazing, but she references or quoted the Old Testament here, and it says, and Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of his humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mightily deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down the rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, reminding them to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. As Cole comes up, we'll start our worship time this morning. Thanks, Dave. Will you all have to stand with us, please? I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from every fear. Those who look on him are radiant and never be ashamed and never be this poor man cried, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard me and saved me from my enemy, the Son of God surrounds his saints, will deliver Rise. 
reaches out to say that I am set free. Oh, oh, oh. I am set free. Oh, oh, oh. it is for freedom. Hills. I love that song and just being able to just rest in that we're set free in God's grace and his love for us and that's just something that we can just look upon every day especially in something and situations that we're in with this global pandemic and um, you know with our president um, contracting it just it's great to know that we are free no matter um, whether we feel bonded by um, this the things that are going on in, th in this world um, you can go ahead and have a seat we have a couple announcements to go through um, first of all, our home groups for the fall have launched, so they started last week. If you feel like you want to get connected, we still have open sign-ups, so you can go on our website or talk to one of the leaders here um, today. Secondly, our children's ministry launched today, so our three-year-olds and our six-year-olds are meeting inside, and um, there are coronavirus regulations going on for that, so if you were worried about that, you can ask Alex, and he'll be able to explain everything um, with how we're um, handling that, and with children's ministry comes the need for volunteers, so if you feel like you're called to serve in that way, it would be about a four to five week rotation, we wouldn't put you there every week, so if you feel like you want to serve in that way, you can contact, contact Alex Bruda as well. And our high school and middle school uh, ministries have started meeting again in our um, vicinity over here. We met last week for our middle school group, and it just felt really good to kind of go back to normal, kind of felt like we never left, um, just being able to go back to how things were and kind of get the kids back into a regular routine instead of being like, well, we're going to be at this house this week and the park the next week. It'll be kind of good to get back into the regulation of things. 
And lastly, it is our communion Sunday, so we have our little cups here for those that are here. And if you're at home, then we just encourage you to grab some elements by the end of the service so that you can join us with that. And it is also um, the first Sunday of the month, so we have our benevolence offering. Um, that offering is just um, any families that maybe have a financial need, it'll be able to go towards them to help with that. So if you feel led to give that way, you can just put on the bottom of your check benevolence offering, or if you're using cash, you can um, put it in an envelope and just go ahead and write on that. So we're going to go ahead and pray for the rest of our service. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much that we can just come together and whether we're meeting inside, outside, or online, Lord, I just thank you that you've given us the opportunity to come meet with one another. I just pray for the rest of the service, Lord, and be with Randy as he teaches us from your word. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Leo, stand with us. God is my shepherd, I won't be wanting, I won't be wanting. He makes me rest in fields of green, a quiet stream. of God forever. See, God is my shepherd. God is my shepherd. I won't be wanting. of God forever in the house of God forever sing your 
shepherd staff one last time. Your shepherd staff, it comforts me. You are my feast in the presence of enemies. And surely goodness will follow me. Will follow me in the house of God forever. In the house of God forever. of God forever. Amen. And will you please remain standing for the reading of the word. Good morning. This morning we're going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 4. I'll give you a minute to get there. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be beginning in verse 26. This is the word of the Lord. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to submit our hearts to your word this morning. And Father, we just pray that you would be here, that you would teach us, that you would help us to be open with open ears and a soft heart to hear your word from Randy this morning. Father, we pray that Randy would decrease and that you would increase, that he would faithfully deliver your message and that you would be upon him and help him to do so boldly and freely. Father, we thank you for your word and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Brett. I'm not sure I can add much to uh, the subject of anger uh, other than what he just read from Ephesians, but I'm going to spend about 30 minutes trying. (laughs) In the 1980s, the late 1980s, a movie came out by the name of Broadcast News. And there was a scene where a frustrated news anchor began talking about all of the things that were wrong with the world. He talked about the economic depression and those who had lost their jobs. He referred to the never-ending homicides and other violent crime that filled the news every day. He said things are so bad that we're afraid to go outside for fear of what's out there that might hurt us. The disintegrating environment, the threat of attack by other countries and government that continues to increase invading our personal lives. And then he looked at the camera and he said, it's bad. We all know it's bad, and we've all had enough. So what we're going to do is I want you to get up. I want you to get up out of your chair, and I want you to go to the window and stick your head out and yell at the top of your lungs, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. That may be the most prophetic movie scene ever. Because as I look out on our world and our country, As I read and I listen to the news, as I watch protests, listen to politicians insult and call each other liars, many of us are already ready to stick our heads out the window and say that very same thing. We're mad. And we're so mad we justify burning our cities, breaking windows and looting. We justify hate speech against authorities such as the police with words like, and I quote, I hope your precinct burns down with all of you inside and you burn to death. 
We're angry with our politicians. We're angry about a virus. Angry our hair and nail salons got shut down. Angry our businesses are struggling. Angry we're told to wear a mask and that church can't meet indoors and we can't travel and our second stimulus check is stuck in Congress and so on. Today, our culture and our world is seething with anger about to boil over. And God help us on November the 3rd. What are we going to do? Oh, it's easy to blame everybody else for the anger that's going on. After all, I'm not starting fires and I'm not looting. I don't threaten the police and I even trust God for the upcoming election. But yet I believe the anger that is being played out on the big stage is a result of anger that lives and festers in many of our hearts. And it's this anger that boils out and becomes sin of every kind. Proverbs 29, 22 says, A man of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger causes much transgression. This means that anger is the seed that when cultivated will grow into much more egregious sin. It's anger that sits at the ready any time somebody tries to correct you and you immediately spit out, yeah, but you, or yeah, but they, or you don't have to deal with the pain that I'm dealing with. It's an anger that lives, for the, lives and dreams for revenge. And if revenge can't be directed at the one who hurt us, others will know others must endure our wrath instead. There was a time years back when I was so angry towards someone that in my mind I had permission to say whatever I wanted to say about that person. And if anyone tried to correct me, I would immediately list all of their wrongs. But you know what? This only made me the one who was miserable to live with. My anger entitled me to stir up strife to everyone I met. And my sin was flowing from every pore in me. Pride, gossip, hatred, jealousy, and the list goes on. And my only justification was if I was in pain, everybody had to be in pain. So it's from those few years of my life that that's, this message was born from. Because during those years, God in his mercy led me to his word and his truth. And I learned some very important things about the futility of anger and revenge. But more importantly, I learned some important things about our God. So this morning, I want to share with you some of those things that God taught me during that time. And if we're going to have victory over this subject of anger and revenge, we need to embrace these things in our daily walk with Jesus. But I want to warn you, the things I want to share that God has declared in his word on this subject will be contrary to your sense of fairness. And at first, they will seem illogical, unjust, and of no benefit to you, because they were to me at, fe at first too. But if we want victory over this anger that has become epidemic in many of our lives, stealing our joy and slowly destroying every aspect of our society, we must embrace these truths as biblical must-dos. And the first is this. Victory over angry, anger and revenge is believing God is sovereign over what makes you mad. Believing God is sovereign over what makes you mad. I have to admit, I, I like a good revenge movie. You take someone who has been mistreated or abducted or, mistreat, or misunderstood or bullied, and when you get to the end of the movie, when that evil is finally taken to task, I want to cheer I like it when Batman shows up. I like it when Dirty Harry says, go ahead, make my day. I like it when the Spaniard and the Princess Bride says, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. I like that. That's just good stuff. 
And in some sense, we should rejoice when justice over wrong is finally executed because we are created in the image of God. And God is a just God. So being in his image, we too should love justice. But the problem lies when we decide that we are the ones who deserve to execute that justice. You see, our desire for justice is right. But when we take it on ourselves, it's wrong because we put ourselves in the place of God. In Leviticus 19, 18, God commanded, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Also in Romans 12, 19, it says, Beloved, never avenge yourself. Let me repeat that. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. You see, it isn't our place to take revenge against a wrong, nor do we even bear a grudge. Why? Because God is Lord over all, and vengeance is his job, and execution of judgment is to be his alone, because he is the only one righteous judge, and no, he doesn't need our help. In fact, God goes so far as to say we shouldn't even rejoice when our enemy fails. Proverbs 24, 17, and 18, listen, do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn away his anger from him. When I unpack these two verses, this is what I see. If God is sovereign over all things, and he alone has the right to execute justice and vengeance, if I, even in my heart and mind, are longing for the day when someone who hurt me finally gets his, that displeases God to the point he may turn his anger away from him and leave me as the only one in pain. In my experience, the angrier, angrier I became when I was wrong, the more successful the one that hurt me became leaving me deeper in anger than the day before. And it wasn't until I trusted God's complete sovereignty and his ability to judge fairly and completely that the pain began to dissolve into contentment, knowing that he alone could right that wrong. Years ago, I knew a woman who at, the t at one time was married to a pastor and that pastor had an affair with a member of their church, and the result of that affair was divorce, leaving her with three children that she raised on her own, and he hardly ever paid her child support. She had every right, humanly speaking, to be angry. But she lived with so much anger and bitterness, wishing him harm every single day, that the result was that she died an early death that I believe was brought on by an enormous amount of emotional pain while he lived seemingly carefree. I've often wondered what it would have been like for her if she could have forgiven him and allowed her sovereign Lord to bring about justice instead of living every day wishing him harm. I wonder if the outcome would have been reversed because this verse seems to imply that her unbridled anger could turn God's anger from him. Now, everything within us screams, that's not fair. And we shouldn't let anyone get away with that, but God says, stop right there. Vengeance is mine. I am sovereign and you are not. I am the Lord, I will repay, and no matter how mad you want to get at what you deem as unfair, your anger will never produce a righteous judgment. Oh, you may in some sense think that you get revenge, but it will be vengeance that is born out of a sinful heart. And James 1.20 says, For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. 
Last week, Nathaniel brought up the life and struggles of Joseph from the book of Genesis. Joseph's life started out to be charmed. He was favored by his dad, and he was given the best gifts, and he was given the least amount of work of all the brothers. But because of anger, all of that turned sour, sour on him. Because of jealousy and anger, he was sold into slavery in Egypt by his brothers who were angry and envious of him. And because his father was told that Joseph was dead and his brothers could care less, he was completely abandoned. In Egypt, while living, trying to live a righteous and trustworthy life, he was suddenly accused by his master's wife, Potiphar, for something he didn't do. Because of that, he spent years in prison for a crime that he didn't commit. And later, while he was in prison, he was forgotten again by a prisoner that he helped obtain his freedom, leaving him in prison for more years. He was forgotten, falsely accused, in prison for years, even though blameless. And I don't know about you, about this time, if I were him, I would press, press my face up against the bars of that prison cell and say, this isn't fair and I'm bad. But Joseph, years later, when he was reunited with his family and he looked back at God's sovereign plan over his life in Genesis 5.20, he said to his brother who caused all of this pain, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. What good would it have done for Joseph to be angry and bitter? Would that have changed God's sovereign plan for him? Well, it's possibly to the negative as an angry and bitter person would most likely never become the most respected man in all of Egypt. And he also had the perfect opportunity for revenge. Think about this. When his family finally came to Egypt because of the food was a shortage and there was a famine, he could have had them all killed. He could have thrown them into prison like he had been. He had the power to do that. He had the authority. But yet when he saw his brothers and father, he wept with joy. I've lived on both sides of anger. One side where bitterness and revenge consumed me and the walls of anger held me prisoner. But the other side was the freedom of knowing that God is in sovereign control, even though it didn't seem fair to me at the time. God is sovereign over all things, even the things that make you mad. The second thing I learned is that anger is more of a choice than an emotion. So my second point is this. Victory over anger and revenge is to wisely consider the consequences of anger's emotion. To wisely consider the consequences of anger's emotion. I want you to listen to the following verses as I read them, and I want you to listen for the common theme. Proverbs 14, 29, Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Proverbs 15, 18, A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. Proverbs 16, 32, whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. In Proverbs 19, 11, good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. All these verses have the same line, be slow to anger, which means we have the ability to control it. And if we don't, we are foolish, we create friction, we will lose what we are trying to achieve, and any respect or glory we hope to recover by losing our temper will be lost. Now, some think that being slow to anger is if I don't openly or emotionally act out my anger. After all, I did refrain from hitting them 
or telling them off. And I didn't take a Louisville slugger to the car as Carrie Underwood did. But the problem is, is that there are many things that anger can manifest us in that's so much in other ways than just physical or verbal assault. There is the slow burn that often it's displayed in the silent treatment or to intentionally ignore someone's presence. It's walking out or even having an affair in order to lash out at your spouse. It is the thought that you would be much happier if that person would get hurt or die. And it's in our gossip in order to ruin someone's reputation with others. There are many ways that anger can get its revenge other than physical violence, but God in his word, and especially in the book of Proverbs, calls us to a much different approach. Proverbs 17, 9, instead of retaliation and gossip, we are told whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. In Proverbs 17, 27, instead of getting heated and lashing out, whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. I remember in the months following the offense that made me so angry when I would be around others and the subject would come up, I could give all kinds of reasons for my anger. I can even give you chapter and verse as to why they were wrong. But do you know whose reputation ended up in the mud? It was mine. As I must have heard dozens of times, come on, Randy, you've got to let this go. You need to move on from this. This isn't like you. But somehow we think if we let it go or we don't retaliate, it will appear as if what they did to us was no big deal. So the question is, how do we let it go? How is it possible to act like nothing really happened to me while they seemingly get away scot-free? The answer is this. In, in the middle of the emotion that anger often brings, you slow down and you think clearly and you focus on the truth. The truth that God can be trusted to handle this. And his judgment is much more fair than mine. And when I consider his wrath in regards to sin and his ability to pour out vengeance on that is fair and just to what is wrong, I certainly don't want to put my sin in those crosshairs. Now, I'm not saying that if you were in an abusive situation or if you were in a dangerous situation this morning because of someone else that you just have to sit there and take it while waiting for God to come and take out your abuser. I'm not saying that. No way. In fact, if you're in an abusive situation this morning, you get out. You go get some help, and you find somebody that will, that will be your ally in this, and you remove yourself from that position, and you may have to report it to the authorities. But what I am saying and what I believe the Bible teaches is that after you remove yourself from that wrong situation, you do not hold anger and bitterness against them. You trust God's judgment and his vengeance against that person, and in turn, you live as Jesus did when he was endured wrong by sinful men. Jesus went to the cross with no bitterness or no anger toward the people who hit him, spit on him, mocked him, and nailed him there. He didn't shake his fist at God and say, this is unfair, and he didn't take the revenge upon himself, even though he had the power to pour out vengeance on those who were mistreating him. Instead, he said, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. Listen to 1 Peter 2, 21 and 23. For to this you have been called, that's you and me, for to this we have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But now listen to this. 
but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. That's Jesus on the cross, committing himself and entrusting himself to his Father who is able to judge justly. I have come to realize personally that anger that leads to revenge is unbelief. Unbelief that God is who he says he is. That when God says he will repay, we don't believe he can or he will. We don't believe that God will in fact judge fairly, so I need to be the judge. And we stop believing that when Jesus went to the cross, he died for all the sins of the world, even for the sins of the one who hurt you. To wisely consider the consequences to the emotion of anger is to consider the gospel that saved you. It is to ask yourself this question when you are angry and you want revenge. Do I really want to put myself above the love and the mercy of Jesus who died for that sin? Just like he died for my sins. Do I really want to declare myself as the judge of who God should truly forgive? Proverbs 20, 22 says, do not say. That means we talk to ourselves. Do not say, I will repay evil. Wait for the Lord and he will deliver you. This means that we need to talk to ourselves when we're angry and say, do not say this is my responsibility. Do not say I need to repay. Instead, you say, this is God's problem and I will trust his judgment and his hand on my life. And by my response, I will represent him accurately for his glory and not mine. This leads us to our third and last point. Victory over anger and revenge is seeing an offense as an opportunity to be like Jesus. It's seeing an offense as an opportunity to be like Jesus. I think sometimes we see Jesus as a distant master who says he understands but ultimately doesn't. So we tend to be frustrated with him when he doesn't immediately ease our pain. When my wife gave birth to our three sons, I was there each time to comfort her and help her the best I could and just to show her I loved her. But one thing I could never do is say, I know how you feel. There is no way I could ever know what giving birth is like, nor do I want to. But, I, but all I could just be was a worried and helpless observer. In fact, if I had said I know how you feel, my usually calm and easygoing life would have probably made it quite clear that I don't. And that's the way we often respond to others and even to Jesus when we are hurt. We don't think anybody can really understand the pain we are going through. And to some extent, that may be true. Some may not. It's possible that many can't understand the physical abuse that you've experienced. Maybe they haven't had their name defamed or falsely accused or hated or rejected or laughed at because they're different than you. But Jesus completely understands. And for our sake, he endured much in order to show us mercy and forgiveness Shouldn't we replicate that same grace toward others who hurt us? But in addition to Jesus, there are also many in the church that understand your pain and struggle against the abuse and rejection of others. In our study on faith a few months ago of Hebrews 11, you may remember at the end of the chapter 11, there were many who were hated mistreated, rejected, physically whipped, stoned, imprisoned, and endured painful executions. But yet they all held fast to the truth of God, even though they never saw God's wrath levied against their tormentors. And because of their testimony, we are reminded in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, that we are to respond in the same way. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising his shame, and is seated at the right hand of God, at the throne of God. You and I are not alone in this battle over anger and revenge because of mistreatment. We have, many have gone before us and have endured the same or even worse, and Jesus stands at the head of that line. He isn't a distant Savior who doesn't understand why you want to retaliate when you're wronged. He completely understands your anger when you are rejected, tormented, and mistreated. And he says to every one of us, I know exactly how you feel. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. He knows how we feel. He knows the temptation to retaliate because he knows how rejection feels. He knows how physical and emotional abuse affects us, but he also knows how to avoid the temptation that leads anger into sin. So how do we be like Jesus when we are tempted with anger that will ultimately allow us to, to turn into bitterness and revenge? The counsel to that question is found in Ephesians 4 that we read earlier. Starting at verse 26 and 27, it says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity for the devil. So first of all, let's make it clear, not all anger is sin. The statement, be angry, makes that clear. And as I stated earlier, since we are created in the image of God, the desire for justice is good, and the lack of justice should make us angry. This week I listened to a sermon by Ravi Zacharias, and he made the statement, a world without justice is safe for no one. And as you consider our country today, where our justice system is no longer trusted, anger is a natural response. So be angry at the lack of justice. But verse 26 continues, and do not sin. Anger never, ever gives us permission to retaliate with sinful actions. And the next phrase of verse 26 and then into 27 gives us this antidote for sinful anger when it says, do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now, some believe this means that we don't go to sleep at night until we've contacted the person who offended us and you work it out. And although that's good counsel and it can't achieve some positive results, my question is this. What if you don't work it out? Do you stay up continually and keep talking about it until you get the resolution you want? Because in my experience, lack of sleep seldom aids in resolving conflicts. What this means is this is that you and you alone are to let go of that anger and let go of it quickly before the sun sets. Because if you harbor anger and bitterness in your mind and heart, Satan will own you, and retaliation will be your only desire. But how do you let it go quickly? How do you not take it to bed with you and wake up the next morning with vengeance on your mind? You have to take that anger as an opportunity to be like Jesus. And you must forgive them with a kind and tender heart. Is that easy? No. Does that seem fair? No. Is it the right thing to do? Absolutely. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says this. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. In a world where anger is at its all-time boiling point, we as believers in Christ must represent Jesus well. We must believe that he can and will execute wise and righteous judgments 
on everything that seems unfair, even the things that make us mad, because he is sovereign over all of those things. We must slow down and think wisely about when our actions want to trigger, our actions when anger triggers an emotional response because anger is to never justify our sin. It never justifies our sin in order to bring justice, on, vengeance on those who sin against us. The anger of man, your anger, will never produce the righteousness of God. And most importantly, when we are hurt, abused, offended, abandoned, or feel forgotten, remember you have a Savior that knows exactly how you feel. So we must take those hurts and those offenses and use them as an opportunity to be like Jesus. Worship team, why don't you come up as we prepare our hearts for communion this morning. Let's bow together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your word. And sometimes your word is hard because it asks us to do things that are just absolutely contrary to our human nature. Father, I just pray that we would be a people here at Temecula Hills that rejoice in your truth to the point where we do not retaliate against what is wrong, but we hold fast to the truth that you can bring justice. It's your responsibility. It's not ours. Give us a love for you that loves others when we are offended and to give us a heart to forgive as you forgave us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come now, fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song, sung by flaming tongues above praise the mount I'm fixed upon it mount of thy redeeming love here I raise my Ebenezer Hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue. Me from danger interposed his precious blood. No, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Sealed it for thy courts above. 
prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. In John chapter 6, Jesus makes an outlandish statement. He says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. And as you can imagine, the people that heard that thought that was the craziest thing they ever heard. In fact, some of you this morning probably think that's pretty crazy too. In fact, his disciples even made the statement, this is a hard thing you just said. I don't get this. When you consider the most important need that you have outside of breathing, it is food and water. You can take away almost everything else, but in order to sustain life, you have to have food, and water. In fact, Jesus at this particular time had just finished feeding 5,000 with just a little bit of bread and a couple of fish. And so the people are coming to him for food thing, and this is awesome. We got food all the time with this guy. But Jesus says this, unless you consume me as the most important thing in your life, unless you seek me more than you seek physical sustenance, you will never have eternal life. So he puts himself as a much higher value than even the food that sits on your table. This important concept of desiring Jesus more than anything that the world offers is why Jesus asks, why Jesus asks us to take communion together. As a reminder to always remember him when you sit down at a meal and remember that he is more value and he is more important than even the food that sits in front of you. So as he sat with his disciples that night before he was crucified, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body. And then Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's drink. I want to thank you for coming this morning, I want to thank you for Hope God was blessed you with his word this morning. I have one more announcement before we leave, and I pray for us as we leave. Dave and Bobby DeFuria are going to be, in the next few weeks, are going to be moving to Orange County. And although that is going to be a loss for us, it certainly is a loss for me. I've grown to know them and love them, and man, we've just spent great times together, and so this is going to be hard for me. But I really believe as I spent time and I talked to Dave about this, this is absolutely what God is leading them to do. I'm excited for the process as they get to be with their children who all live in Orange County and even their new pending grandson that is about to be born. So uh, when you see them in the next couple of weeks, would you just do me a favor and thank them for their ministry to us? They have been a blessing for sure. Let's pray for them and pray for uh, the, the rest of our day. Father, we thank you for Dave and Bobby and for their influence in our lives. Thank you for their love and care for us. And Lord, I thank you for their, uh, their ministry into my life and how he's encouraged me and helped me and, and been a mentor to me in many ways. Thank you for that love. Lord, I pray that you would just be in all the details of their move as they sell their house, as they, as they make arrangements, Lord, just I pray that you'll bless every step of the way, and more importantly, Lord, that you would bless the ministry that you're leading them to in, their children, in the lives of their children and their grandchildren 
and the church that you're going to lead them to, that they may be able to expand your kingdom in a great way. And we give you the praise for who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming. Would you please help us pick up the chairs and have a great afternoon.